remember, in fact, uh, I, I once did a talk with uh, Sister Lauren Booth, and uh, the talk was about Africa, Muslims or Islam in Africa. And, and I remember, in fact, that she spoke after I did. So she came to the stage and she said, Brother, I'm very happy that you spoke about Africa. My talk, in fact, was about Rwanda, the, the country of Rwanda in Africa. And I spoke about the genocide in 1994 in Rwanda. And she came at the end of, after my talk, and she came and she said, Brother, I'm so happy that you spoke about Rwanda. It's amazing that you spoke about Rwanda, and I'll tell you why, she said. Because she said last week or the week before, I spoke about Muslims in Africa and Islam in Africa and the beautiful country of Africa, a continent of Africa. And she said, uh, she said uh, what was amazing was that after my talk, these two young ladies came to me and uh, wearing hijab and, and they said, uh, sister, we are young uh, sisters from uh, Rwanda. And we have the most amazing story to tell the world, but no one seems to want to hear it. So I'm going to give you a glimpse, inshallah, of the story that no one seems to want to hear. The most amazing story in the world, as the sisters they said. Uh, Africa, is a, Africa is a beautiful continent. Rwanda is an amazing country. It's called the country of, the, of a thousand hills. And a fertile land is made up of beautiful natural space, uh, amazing scenery, uh, animals, wildlife. And Muslims have been living there for a long time. And they numbered about 10% of the population of Rwanda. And 80% were Christians. Uh, ethnically, it's divided into three main tribes, groups of people, ethnicities. 85% uh, of them were uh, Hutus, and about 14% were Tutsi, and 1% were the Twa, the Twa people. And uh, anyway, there was, of course, ethnic division between these tribes in Africa, in Rwanda, for a long time. And the colonial powers, particularly Belgium, had pitted one group against the other group. They gave credence to the Tutsis, uh, the minority, over the majority Hutu people. On April the 6th, 1994, an aeroplane carrying the late presidents of Rwanda and Burundi uh, was shot down. And the attack was immediately blamed on the Tutsi, the minority, Tutsi rebels. And when the plane was shot down, almost immediately, almost overnight, the country descended into uh, an, a violence, a campaign of violence, of killing, of mass murder, and you find these two ethnicities of the Hutus and the Tutsis are now at loggerheads. The Hutus are on the run uh, to find the minority Tutsis. Any Tutsi would do. Any Tutsi would do. If your neighbor is a Tutsi, he's, he's fair game. In, it's, it's okay to kill him. Your child, if your uh, principal, if your neighbor, your church minister, anybody, any Tutsi is fair game. And that's exactly what happened. Almost overnight, the country descended into this escalating violence campaign of hatred, of hatred. And that's where it begins. It begins with a seed of hatred. Nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, I'm going to take my machete and hack people to death, particularly if I know them. Maybe they're my friends or my, I go to the same church as them or attend the same school as them. Nobody wakes up with the idea of just doing that begins, a seed is planted, and the seed is a seed of hatred, antagonism, animosity. It grows, it festers, becomes something uncontrollable, uncontrollable, sadistic urge people have just to kill for the sake of killing. In fact, that's what they carry, the do or the die, kill or get killed. And so people were hacking to death. You know, when you think about violence, when I think about violence, at least, there are, of course, different ways that people get killed. It's sad as a discourse, but it's true. So, you know, we have a, a killing by way of uh, uh, like an altitude killing, a, a height killing, or a distant killing. And we have a, a, a killing by way of proximity, a, close, a closeness killing. And so if you think about people flying their F-16 fighter jets over villages and dropping bombs, you know, the pilot of that F-16 fighter jet might be miles away even before the bomb even drops. He's so far off. You won't see the carnage, you won't see the mess, you won't hear the cries, the screaming, the wailing, the, the begging, the pleading. He's completely detached because he's just so far off, far off. There's no feeling, there's, no, there's very little uh, consideration 
I've just killed a lot of people, I've destroyed homes, I've, I've polluted uh, you know, uh, 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 lakes or fields or I've upset the natural balance of, of that village, nothing, because you're so far off by that time. But to kill one person, for that uh, a pilot of the F-16 fighter jet to take a, a knife and stab one person, a child for example, requires much more effort. Because he's engaged and he's seeing the human, the humanity of the, the human experience, the human experience of killing. He's seeing the humanity at play. If he has a knife and he's going to plunge that knife in somebody, that person is going to beg for his life. Plead, please don't kill me because my mother has cancer. Give any anything, or my child has autism, or my aunt has whatever. Could be anything, or I'm I'm about you know it could be anything. But he's going to plead for his life, or she'll plead for her life. And he has to overcome this, overstep this, and then decide to, you know, stab the person. And then he's confronted with the gore, like in Macbeth. Like in Macbeth when he kills King Duncan and then he says, you know, I can't, I've murdered sleep. And then Lady Macbeth says, I can't clean that spot because it's just infested. It's something that's come upon you, upon you. You've seen the mess. You've seen what you, your hands have done. You've done that thing. And then even when the person is about to die, still if they have any life in them, they would say, please call, help, help, call an ambulance. Something, anything to help me. And they have, the person has to overstep that. And so you see, therefore, that the person in a, is in a position to empathize when he's up close, up close. But when you're high up in altitude or so far up, or you're just shooting people, you don't, what do you, you don't feel, you feel less at least, you feel less at least. In the case of Rwanda, they were hacking people to death. To hack somebody to death, you've got to be up close to them. You've got to be up close to them and, and, and seeing the skin rip from their skins on their heads and the scars. You're seeing the blood. It's on you. And so you've got to think, well, wow, that must be real hatred in the hearts of those people to be able to do that. But they did it overnight, hacking people to death. And that is a hatred disseminated by the inter -Hamway. The inter -Hamway. The inter -Hamway were a, a group of armed militia, young people, youth, armed youth. And they would kill openly in the streets of Rwanda, in the capital Kigali of Rwanda, kill openly. And uh, they had this, they lived by this thing of do or die, kill or get killed. Um, and they went on. And, and they even gave people incentives for killing. And they told people, if you kill, then you would have uh, money, would give you food, you could inherit the land of the Tutsis that you're killing. And so people are thinking, well, either we kill or we get killed, and so we'll just kill. And they killed, and they killed, and they killed. So in about a hundred days, up to a million people were killed. Just think about that. In a hundred days, 90 to 100 days, a million people were killed largely by hacking to death. And who is killing who? Neighbors are killing their neighbors. If there are intermarriages, then maybe the husband's killing the wife, killing the children, killing everyone's killing everyone. The killing the church ministers, killing the teachers, killing everybody as long as he's a Tutsi. And what is the main difference between the two? If it's ethnicity, it's Physical, so they're going to look a bit different. You know, one group might have slimmer noses, the other one has more, you know, puffed up noses. One group uh, is uh, slimmer, other group is, is a bit chubbier. One group is taller, the group is shorter. But they speak the same language and they worship in the same churches and they, uh, they're both black. You know, what is the thing? But it's a small thing, taking a small thing and making this fester and grow. A small human difference, but making it grow as if it's you become the ultimate other. You are othered, completely othered. You're no longer part of the self of humanity. You become the external other. And that's exactly what happened. And so there's Muslims in Rwanda, by the way. <laughs> there's Muslims in Rwanda, right? About 10% of Rwanda is Muslim. And 85% is Catholic Christian. And who's killing who? The Catholics are killing the Catholics. It's a, it's, a, it's a killing between 
Christians. The victims are the Christians and the perpetrators are the Christians. Now, the Muslims in Rwanda, of course, they're in this situation. They, they, know, they don't choose to be where they are in that time, but it's the situation has arisen. And what road, what route would one take in that situation? Seeing engulfed in this crazy killing all around you. What role would a Muslim take? And I understand now you understand the sentiment between what those sisters were saying to Sister Lauren Booth. We have the most amazing story to tell the world, but no one seems to want to hear it. And I'll tell you why. Because the Muslims, in fact, the killing began at a place called Lake Mugasera. Many hundreds of lakes all around Rwanda and the, the hills, the, the country of a thousand hills. And what the Hutus began to do, began to kill these Tutsis and dump their bodies uh, in the lake, uh, either to try and drown them or they would shoot them or they would hack them and just dump their bodies in the lake. And one of the first things the Muslims began to do is that they would take their canoes by night and they would row and row and row in the night to try and search for any surviving victims. If anybody might have survived, might have just, if there was a chance anybody had lived and hadn't died, to try and bring out their body from the sea, from the lake, and try and resuscitate that person. And they began to do this. And so you find all these canoes were going to try and find anybody, any Tutsi that might have survived, and they were Christians. They were all Christians. And the people began to ask the Muslims, why are you doing this? Like, why would you put your life on the line to rescue somebody that you have no real, you know, you don't have um, the same religion as them, although you're both Africans, but if you are seen to rescue them, then you run the risk of being killed yourself. Why would, you, why would you sacrifice your own life to try and save the life of somebody else? Where does that sentiment of putting self-sacrifice over self-interest come? How do we learn as human beings to put empathy over and above and before indifference? Where does that stem from? And they said, well, we're only doing what Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah in the Quran tells us, من أجل ذلك تبنى على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا It's because of the reason of a murder In fact the first murder من أجل ذلك For that reason Because of the murder We decreed for Bani Israel And wrote for them that whoever takes a life Without warrant without justification, without authority, or sows corruption on the earth, it's as if he's taken the life of the whole of humanity. But whoever saves a life, then it's as if he has saved the life of the whole of humanity. There is a, a restoring of hope, a restoring of hope in the saving of life of one person, like in the famous uh, uh, John Doe poem that no man is an island unto himself, right? The death of any man, what did he say? The death of any man? Diminish me, diminish, diminishes me because I am for humankind. I never set to see for whom the bell tolls because it tolls for thee, it tolls for you. Right? We collectively die in the death of anybody if that death is unchallenged, unchecked, and if it's a death based upon an injustice. We collectively lose something from the hope of a human spirit. We collectively fail. We collectively fail as human beings. If even one person is killed unjustly, there is a failing in all of us. But if you're, save, if you're saving a life, you're restoring a hope that was lost or that was diminishing, but you're restoring the hope. And they began to remind them about these evidences. That the first thing the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Awwal Shayin, the Prophet said, the first thing that people will be judged between themselves on the Day of Judgment, Yom Al Qiyamah, uh, the Prophet said between blood that if blood has been spilt between people then that's the first thing that Allah will check on the Day of Judgment between people if blood has been spilt it is no small issue therefore that people needlessly uh, spill the blood of each other that is not a small thing that is the first thing that Allah will check between people on the Day of Judgment and the Muslims of Rwanda they knew this and the Imams of the Masajid were preaching this and the congregation was understanding and learning about this. And so it made all perfect sense to them. They were teaching the, the Hutus and the Tutsis that the difference between you is one of ethnicity. 
you're both the same. You look more or less the same. Just small, subtle differences between you, that's it. And they began to remind them what Allah says in the Quran. The Imams are preaching those verses that connect the dots. They were saying, Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, ayyuhan nas is, is O oh, civilization, O oh, humanity, O oh, all people. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa untha. We created you from a male and a female. Waja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. And we made you into nations and tribes. Why? Why? So that we live in an animosity and antagonism and hatred with one another? No. Allah says, لِتَعَارَفُوا So you would recognize each other. <laughs> Allah Akbar. <laughs> Allah Akbar. So you would simply just be able to see who is who. Recognize one another. And then the, the main climax is in أَكْرَمَكُمْ in the light أَتْقَاكُمْ The most noble of you in the eyes of Allah is not the one who is light or the one who is dark. Not the colonial you know, enterprise of pitting one lighter skin group against the, the darker skin group. No. The most noble of you in the eyes of Allah are those who have the most piety out of all of you. And that's something in the unseen. That's something Allah will test and evaluate on the Day of Judgment. It's a matter of the heart. Your external self is one thing, but that's not the main thing. This is why when the man came in, in Mecca and he began to uh, shake when he saw Nabi Sallallahu <laughs> Because the Prophet had awe. And he's shaking and he's seeing him. And the Prophet said to him, Oh, when I like, finally, let's do manik, just cool down, chill out. Relax because I'm not a king. In the Ibn Imr min Quraysh, I am the son of a woman from Quraysh who used to eat just dried salty meat on the floor in the desert. Meaning not, it's not about an image projection that you see how great we are because of the way that we look. No. It's about the ideals that we carry. It's about the belief that we have. He said in the hadith, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila tsamikum wa la ila afsurikum. Allah does not look at your forms and your images and your shapes. But Allah looks at your hearts. And that's the message that they were conveying to all the people, the Muslims and the Christians. They thought, they said, you, you are two ethnicities of Hutu and Tutsi. The ayah I mentioned in the Quran before is about two brothers, two sons of the same father and the father of all of us, Adam السلام, who had two sons, Habil and Qabil, and one turned on the other one and took his knife and it was about, he said, لَقْتُلَنَّكَ I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. How easy we use those words, or I'm just going to kill you. And the brother, what does he say? Does he say, well, I'll kill you back? What, what does he say? I'll, I'll kill you too? I, I'll, I'll kill you before you kill me? He said, لَإِنْ بَسَطَّ أَلَيْ يَدَكْ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِطٍ يَدِي إِلِيكْ لَقْتُلَكْ If you stretch your hand towards me to kill me, I will not stretch my hand towards you to kill you. Why? Inni Allah Rabbil Alameen. I fear Allah, the Lord of the world. Right? So, about restraint. You know what's amazing? I said, yeah, amazing. I think the event I had with Sister Lauren Booth and other speakers was in the month of Ramadan. Uh, and it's amazing, in fact, that the genocide in Rwanda began just a week or so after Ramadan ended in 1994. So, why is it that the Muslims, they argue, did not have this non-participation uh, policy amongst themselves, not to participate in the killing of anybody? They said because, one of the reasons is because they just came from a spiritual high in Ramadan. Right? In Ramadan, they were a spiritual high. They just fasted. And what do we understand about the fast? In the fasting, of course, we, we are not only not eating and drinking, but we're protecting the eyes and the ears and the tongue and the hands and the limbs and everything else in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what actually in, came about in Rwanda was the physical effects of that spiritual piety, right? So that you, your worship is not arbitrary or abstract. Now it's making sense to other people in society. Remarkable. In, in Mabari, in the town of Mabari, they used to uh, say that you know you could take the cows of the people, take their cows if you want, take their cows, kill their cows, eat the meat of the cows, but honor the sanctity of human life, honor the sanctity of human life. They began to pay people not to kill, paying people not to kill. This is why in the entirety of the genocide, over 100 days afterwards, there was not a single Muslim religious leader 
who was charged, who was convicted, who was arrested on anti-war crimes. Not a single Muslim leader. And what the Imams used to do is they used to open wide their doors of their mosques, their masajid. What is a mosque? It is a place of refuge. We re learn in Surah Al-Kahf in the Quran, إِذْ أَوَلْ فِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا they, they sought refuge in the cave. The masjid is like the kahf, it's like the cave. It's a place of safety and refuge. And so they opened wide the doors. Any Tutsi on the run, they would welcome them in. They used to disguise them. The Muslim women took off, to, gave them their, their hijabs and said, why don't you just wear the headscarf and, and try and look like a Muslim. In that case, they want to see that you're a Christian. And the men would give them the prayer beads. Just sit in the mosque and just do something with your fingers and say something, whatever. But at least you're, you're going to be seen as if you're a Muslim. Wear the headscarf so that people can think that you're a Muslim. In trying to help them, they would bring them food and drink and medicine to try and alleviate their suffering and their hunger and their thirst, all for the purpose of saving life. And that's truly making a lot of sense now for us about why this is a great story that is not told and people don't want to hear it because it's a remarkable story. It's a story of endurance, of sacrifice. Muslims pray five times a day. So Ramadan, of course, is one thing, but the other thing is Salah. You know, Muslims were both Hutus and Tutsis out of the 10% that were Muslim. In fact, the majority of fathers were uh, Hutus and the majority of mothers of Muslims were Tutsis. Now, it is, of course, far more difficult to fathom killing somebody that you're kneeling together with five times a day because he's your brother. And that's what Salah establishes with it. For us as Muslims, it establishes a sense of humanity. A, a collective identity. We're all praying in the same place. We're, we're together. We're shoulder to shoulder, ankle to ankle. We're together. This was a remarkable thing. And number three, the compassion and the mercy that Islam is teaching. The Mufti of Rwanda, Mufti Saleh uh, Habimana, was uh, you know, applauded for his efforts in trying to, uh, trying to reduce the antagonism between warring Christian tribes, these, these Hutus and the Tutsis, by reminding them that we all have a human spirit within, inside of us. And Islam teaches about reconciliation. It's remarkable, in fact, that if you think about uh, a, a million people dying in a space of 100 days, how do you reconcile in a society like that? How do you bring people back together again? How do you forgive people for doing something like this? But without reconciliation, he argued, that there can be no regeneration of that society. And he said that what that requires is the heart of a lion. Requires the heart of a lion. That in Rwanda we find a beautiful example of courage, of uh, principle, of uh, empathy, of mercy, and of saving of life. And this is something, inshallah, I think all of us as Muslims can take a lot of lessons from. May Allah make us of those who always put the needs of others first, inshallah. You know, it is, of course, in the Qur'an, Allah praises those who feed people on the day of their own hunger. To feed people on a day of their own hunger. And this was exemplified and even more from the Muslims of Rwanda in that time. In Kigali, in the capital of Rwanda, they used to say, they used to climb up like, you know, high, high places like these. You know, I'm not going to climb this one, I'm going to fall off. But they used to climb high places and they used to say, in this place there are no Hutus and there are no Tutsis. But there are only humans. <laughs> what an amazing message. In this place there are no Hutus and there are no Tutsis. But there are only humans. An amazing message of conciliation. A message of sensitizing the life of a people who were desensitized to violence and dehumanized in that, pl in that process by giving them the hope, the spirit, that maybe if we work together as human beings, we can heal the wounds of a broken and and mend the wounds of a broken society. And this is something, inshallah, I think a lot of us, inshallah, all of us can take a great lesson uh, from, inshallah, the great sacrifice and the principle and the saving of life of so many Catholics. I'll tell you the last thing before I finish. You know, we think about uh, pr giving the message of Islam to people, and of course, we are all obliged to, by Allah and the Quran, to convey this message of Islam to people. But you know, when the genocide came to an end, the conversion rates to Islam from the Catholics, they skyrocketed. Skyrocketed. 
right? That you had thousands and thousands of Catholics now becoming Muslim and coming to the mosque and say, how do I become a Muslim? What is it that the Muslims showed them? Was it just the words, Islam is mercy, Islam is compassion, Islam is peace? No, it was showing them by action. It was exemplifying the spirit, embodying the spirit of, of what you're saying in the first place. Like when the Prophet sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal out to Yemen, what did he say to him? He said many great things. So Salim, he said, Yassira wa la tuassira wa bashira wa la tunafira. Make things easy, don't make things hard. Give people good news, don't make them run away from Mu'ad ibn Jabal says, wa akhir ma ulsani bihi, the last advice the Prophet gave me when I put my foot on the saddle was, وَأَحْسِنْ خُلُقَكْ يَا مُعَادِ مِنْ جَبَلْ Make your character excellent, O Mu'ad ibn Jabal. What if you're speaking a wonderful speech, but people are, are repelled, people are, find your character abhorrent? What if they can't connect to what you're saying because you don't exemplify what you're saying? And the Muslims, the best da'wah they did in those hundred days was action, was by showing the people Islam. And in that situation, the conversion rates of Islam they skyrocketed because people, they wanted, to be, they wanted to be that thing. They wanted to know what is it that inspired you to try and save the lives of so many people. It must be something profound, it must be something divine. And that in fact, of course, was uh, Islam. Jazakumullah khairan, assalamu alaikum.